thank you everyone for showing up. I'm very, very excited that I can share with you the opportunity to explore a little bit more what satellites can do in um, satellite-aided emergency management. And I want to start with the notion that practically leads us at Planet, which is that you can't fix what you can't see. Um, and this resulted in the mission that we're following. So why is Planet doing what Planet is doing? Is um, that we want to image the entire globe on a daily basis to make change um, visible, accessible, and actionable. Um, how do we do this? We operate two satellite constellations, which we develop, build, and operate by ourselves with the headquarters in San Francisco and also um, another office here in Berlin. Um, and I'm going to start with the um, left constellation you see here, which um, is about this big, actually. It's a CubeSat. Um, and that enables us to have about 180 to 200 of these satellites in orbit. Um, and they take images in 3-meter spatial resolution on a daily basis. So 3-meter spatial resolution, for everyone that hasn't heard it, means on one image that you have, one pixel is 3 meters on the ground. Um, so these satellites take these images also in a, um, with eight spectral bands. So um, spectral analytics work in a sense, um, I think all of you have heard that grass looks green because it's actually everything but green. And this is the same technology that spectral analytics are doing. So they send a specific wavelength to the Earth. And what you get back is the analytics um, that you get out of it. In addition to this um, constellation, we also operate a second satellite constellation called SkySat. And this is um, a constellation that majorly distinguishes itself from the other um, satellites in that it doesn't take images automatically every day, but only on demand. So practically, you send the satellite where it's supposed to take an image. And it takes an image in a higher spatial resolution of 50 centimeters, so six, uh, six times more than the um, super doves that you've seen before. Um, and you also have some, some limited capacity of these spectral analytics, but not all the bands that you have on um, the super doves. I was supposed to show you a video here. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work with the PowerPoint because I've not created it in PowerPoint. But if you're interested, our stand is like 20 meters down there. And I'm going to show you the um, video afterwards. But um, instead, let's talk about um, what Planet is doing with this data. So what we're aiming to do is really provide you with this um, daily and globally available data. Um, we process the data already to a certain degree so that it is analysis ready, and you can jump straight into what you're planning to do with the data. And we provide this data via our own software. It's a WMS we've developed, and um, also the, the APIs and generally the cloud architecture which we've brought to, um, to industry standards. The entire process that we do for disaster management um, can be separated in uh, tip and queue and also deeper analytics. So tipping basically means you monitor large areas and um, until you eventually get a, get a tip of an event that is about to happen, let's say, for example, a flood. And, th and then you queue the higher spatial resolution satellite in order to take a, a, an image of this place in an even higher detail. And on top of that, with the spectral indices, for example, you can um, create analytics in order to um, predict floods, uh, model wildfire, um, and so on and so forth. I'm going to show you some, um, some examples for that as well. And um, before these examples start, I want to have a circle around question and maybe ask you for a second what you think you could do if you had an image every day of the entire globe. And you do not need to answer it right now, because obviously I'm also trying to give you some inspiration here. So let's go through the three cases that we have first. Um, and I'm going to circle back to this. Um, and I'm going to start with a use case that is very close to my heart, because I've been working on it for the past two years about. And it is water quality and how to um, better monitor it. So um, this topic that I'm about to start with is um, harmful algae bloom, or um, toxic blue and green algae. Um, Again, uh, there's some um, issues with the translation from, from uh, PowerPoint, so if any um, headings 
are not quite clear. I, apology, uh, I apologize for that. Um, but this is um, what you as a German might have seen already, but I think this is also prominent in most other countries where you, um, where you have lakes. And this is basically warning signs that tell you, please don't bathe here because it can be um, dangerous for you. Do algae have multiple um, health implications? If you come into contact with it, you can um, get a rash, for example, skin irritations, respiratory issues. Worst case um, is death, even though this um, seldomly happens. And uh, I want to go on uh, an example specifically mentioned in the bottom right for every non-German speaker. This is news of a dog that has died due to drinking this water. Um, and this is the lake that we're going to look at. What are you seeing here? This is a compilation of images, of um, planet images with the super doves, and also sentinel images, um, which is a satellite constellation that is publicly available, which is open source from the Copernicus program. Um, and this is the month of July 2021, showing you the exact timeline of this um, case that we were just looking at with the dog. And as you can see, on the bottom, there is the scale. Green means um, very healthy, obviously. And the redder to purple it gets, um, the higher the likelihood that there is toxic blue algae. And you see the development over, um, over the month. 10th and 12th of July are the last sentinel images that you, um, that you were getting. So everything else um, is planet data. And on the 19th of July, the lake was already so contaminated with, um, with toxic algae that it should have been closed off for visitors and people that want to bathe there. However, this information was not available to the officials. Um, therefore, what happened is 20th of July, further contamination. 21st of July, the event happened. And as a result, someone needed to go to the officials. They then manually checked the lake. And only on the next day were able to close it off due to the information that they then collected. Obviously, this could have been um, prevented um, and um, just generally predicted much, much earlier because, of course, it's difficult to um, monitor every lake um, on the ground. There's so many. I imagine mecklenburg vorpommern has about 2,000 lakes, so sending someone to every lake every week um, is quite impossible. Um, another topic I want to address here is um, that we monitor the chlorophyll in this water, which is responsible for um, the toxic blue algae to sprout. However, it is also a main indicator for other environmental hazards, such as very salinated water, for example. And um, what you see here is last year we had a case um, where lots of tons of fish died. And everyone was thinking, OK, why did this happen? Where did this happen? And when did it occur in the first place? Because this was a big mystery um, in the beginning. And Planet, together with its trusted partners, EUMAP, as well as the Helmholtz um, UFZ, um, have conducted an uh, analysis where we used data from the past. So because PlanetScope is taking these images daily, you practically also have images of places that you didn't know you need an image beforehand. So um, it's a little bit like time traveling for, um, for analysts. Um, and you can analyze the water even though the actual contaminated water is long washed away in the ocean already. So with the yellow bands, we were able to, um, to um, detect the chlorophyll contents in the water. What you see here, yellow is uh, bad and green is good. Um, if it would be very red, that would mean, a very, um, would mean a lot of chlorophyll content, basically. Um, and due to this, um, we were able to track back where the water was coming from. Initially, it was a mining company that dumped its very salty water into a side river of the Oder. And with this um, analytics, it was possible to track back um, where the event um, happened and um, who was responsible for it, which is, of course, in terms of this scale of a catastrophe, very important to figure out. So that is what you see on the right side here. The event started on the bottom right in Lipki, where the mine is. Um, and then throughout um, August, you can see how the chlorophyll slowly moves up um, towards the north. And on the bottom left, you see basically um, the chlorophyll contents um, on the upper scale, and to the right, then the dates. 
Um, and then in multiple cities, the chlorophyll content from the 3rd of August about um, rise significantly. And this is an alert system that you can um, create. All the dots are virtual measurement stations, which um, you can have any number of, practically. Um, and this alert system could have been implemented already, but of um, course, at that time, um, officials weren't aware of it, so it wasn't utilized. From water to fire. Wildfire response and prevention is what I want to um, discuss with you next or um, explore with you further. And I'm going to start with a very simple visualization. This is another spectral um, band that we're utilizing for this, um, um, for this image, practically. And it shows you where the burn scars are, where the fire has really um, raged, and which areas are affected to really better assess the damage. I've brought another example, a more recent one, um, that probably most of you are familiar with um, as well, which is from Lahaina on Hawaii. And on the left, you have the before image. You see it's much more vegetated, um, especially towards the water. And then on the right, you um, don't really see that vegetation anymore. On the top of the image, you also see the massive burn scars. Interestingly, um, behind this bigger road towards the right, the vegetation is still fine. Maybe they've managed to um, cut the fire off there. But um, this gives you a better overview of the, of the entire situation. And also enables the next um, product that we've developed in collaboration with Microsoft. Um, this is based on AI and is a building damage assessment, not only telling you which buildings are affected, but also um, to which degree these buildings are affected. So you can better coordinate your on-the-ground um, resources and send help to these places that really need it most and first. What you can do in terms of prevention is um, to utilize soil water content. What you see on the right is a graph that we've developed with um, the National Institute of Wildfires in the Netherlands. And it correlates soil water content with the occurrence of wildfires. Um, and the blue line um, stands for soil water content per cubic meter in the ground. And as you can see in the middle of this graph, um, it significantly dropped for a while, whereas the occurrence of wildfires significantly um, rose during this time. Um, and another video I've planned, but which unfortunately doesn't work. Um, I can also show you this at our booth, of course. Fortunately enough, it's relatively, um, you can still see what it would be telling you. Everything that is very dark blue on this video slash image um, means that the soil is very saturated with water. So there's a very high um, soil water content. Whereas um, on the bottom right that you see there um, next to Italy, um, you see that it's very orange. And this just means the opposite of the scale. So um, it is very, very dry. Um, it's a very dry area, and there's very little water in the soil. Um, this is an early warning indicator for wildfires, but can also be used for, um, for other disasters, such as yield forecasts, for example, droughts um, being also more prominent in um, southern Europe. And then my last example that I want to bring to you, a quick collection of images um, of New South Wales. We um, had a flood here, and this is a planet scope image you can see from, um, from the catastrophe as it happened. And we're going to look a little bit more. This is like the tip and queue process. You were tipped off. This is quite easy to detect in terms of tipping. And then um, you have the details of SkySet, which show you better where the water is really running through, the extent on how deep the water is. This is an entire sports course underwater. And then on the bottom right, you see where the buildings are still unaffected. And most importantly, where critical infrastructure is um, damaged and where you need to focus on repairing um, in order to get these resources that you want to get to the right people, um, especially if you have heavy equipment or machinery that you need to transport. <coughs> and then again, the opposite spectrum, which I briefly mentioned. Um, this is the Atal in particular, where we had a flood two years ago. And um, this is the soil water content before it happened. As you can see, highly oversaturated. And in combination with meteorological data, um, you can, of course, 
with quite a high accuracy forecast that, there, um, that this area was prone to be flooded, considering the, um, the environment that we had.